All right, so we are live. Mm -hmm. All right. Let's see here. We live and in action. So all right, everybody. So we are live and we are in action, everybody. I'm going to stop my share that I have going on here. Um, let's see. All right. So thank you, everybody, for joining on today. This is Candid Conversations with Coach D. Um, we are here for an amazing show. I am so excited about this show. Um, I've been wanting to do it for a while. Um, but I am so, so excited. We have one more panelist that's going to be joining us shortly. Um, but before we really get into that, I want everybody to share, share, share. Um, Mr. Damien, Mr. Jimmy, um, please share. And if you are watching this right now, please take a minute and share. So we're going to all take a pause break and we're going to go share this live feed real quick. Share it to your mama, to your daddy, to your sister, to your fourth cousin to everybody, okay? Because this is gonna be an amazing, amazing topic. So we are excited. So let's go ahead and share it out, okay? Share it to your loved ones, share it to your family members, share it, share it, All right? All right, this is going to be an awesome show. I'm excited about this. Been wanting to do this show for a minute now. Um, so please make sure you share it wherever you are. Share this with your, with your peoples. Share it with everybody. Okay. Share it to my husband real quick. This is going to be a real conversation, y'all. We are going to talk real. We are going to talk real. So please make sure you share. So I have been sharing it out. All right. Looks like we got a good number of people. We got some people watching. So please continue to share it. Um, but I just want to take this time and I just want to say thank you to my guests that are on. I'm going to let them introduce themselves. Oh, we got one person. We got our other um, panelist. He is coming on. All right. Hello, Mr. Ryan. How are you? Hello, doing well. <laughs> awesome. Thank you so much for joining us. We were just taking a pause break to share our this live feed out. Um, it is now live on Facebook. I have it on my page, um, but you can share it to whoever you want to share it to. Um, everybody, make sure that you share this out. So um, let's see. This is going to be an awesome show. Um, I've been, been telling everybody I'm excited because I've been wanting to do this show for a while. Um, and it's coming to fruition. So, and then we're going to go ahead and get started because I don't want to, I don't want to keep y'all all night, um, but I know it's going to be an amazing show. So I'm going to give everybody the chance to, um, to introduce themselves um, so that the viewers know who you are, uh -oh. so that the viewers know who you are, they know what you do and everything. And then we're going to get into the questions. We're going to get into everything. So um, if we can stop with, start with the green uh, fist up in the back, power, <laughs> the black pepper so in the back. If you can yes, go ahead and please, absolutely. can you go ahead and introduce yourself? Go ahead. Yes. Hello, everyone. Um, my name is Damian Harmon. I'm a licensed clinical mental health counselor um, here based in Charlotte, North Carolina. Uh, I've been in this field for over 15 years now. Um, been doing inpatient and mostly outpatient um, services where I do individual family group as well as couples counseling. Um, I do a lot of speaking engagements, a huge mental health advocate for years. Um, I've also dove into um, the other side of speaking is for podcasting. So I do have a platform 
entitled The Couch 704, where we discuss mental health issues every week. I'm also a co-host of a, another sports and mental health podcast called Blow the Whistle, where we, you know, bring on um, NFL veterans, NBA, you know, sports. So we kind of try to combine those two to kind of raise awareness in regards to mental health in the sports field as well. So happy to be here, excited to talk about this topic, especially with, you know, our African-Americans, especially the men. So this is definitely going to be a good, good discussion. Looking forward to it. Yes, this is. So we're going to have to do something else together. Um, just a little bit about myself real quick. So I'm from Fayetteville, North Carolina. And a plug, my cousin actually lives in Charlotte, North Carolina. She went to ECU and she is a mental health therapist. She does the same thing that you does and she lives in Charlotte. Um, but we are going to definitely have to do something together. Can you, you froze for oh, wow. a minute. You, okay. You're still there. You froze for a second. Um, but we're okay. definitely going to have to do something together. I went to the University of South Carolina where I ran there on a full track and field scholarship. And then after that, I ran a professional for Nike for some years. And so I definitely know what you mean about in the professional arena, you know, with the things that we go through mentally and not even that, just seeing what some of us as ex-athletes um you were once an you were once an athlete you know whatever all the validation all those different things what some some right. athletes go through now when that transition that transition mm -hmm. comes so we got to get together we're gonna have to do a whole nother show y'all we gotta <laughs> do the part two we're gonna That's do a whole nother show about sports and athletes i'm for it so we're gonna have to do that okay. um so awesome 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 15 years okay mr ryan if you would go ahead and please introduce yourself as I'm Ryan Smith, known as Rain. Most people know me as Rain. Um, my background in behavioral health has to do with the military. I actually deployed as a behavioral health tech. Um, and that was my experience with counseling and such. We did counseling stateside as well. Um, as the result of being a tech, I worked with a lot of people like, like Mr. Harmon there. Is, that, is it Mr. or Dr.? Mr. Mr. Working on it okay. though. Uh, Working on it. Yeah, though. you know, you know, you gotta respect the name. So, you know, I'm just making sure. <laughs> so yeah, um, work with a lot of providers and uh, just different types of counselors from anywhere from psychiatric nurses to psychologists, psychiatrists, um, a lot of social workers. Um, but yeah, so that was a big thing for me. So I know a lot about the the baby health on the military side, especially when it comes to things like deployment, being away from home adjusting to certain things that was that was the big one it was adjusting <laughs> so stuff like that um outside of that I, i'm a professional photographer so i do a lot of counseling on that end too you'd be surprised <laughs> wow because <laughs> people got stuff going on in their lives but yeah i've always been a big fan of behavioral health my uh, mother used to work with behavioral health um just different businesses different companies she also has a background in working with special needs so special needs adults and special needs kids. So that's kind of where, where I'm at. So I've been around it my entire life. Wow. So now see a part three show uh -oh. <laughs> because um, I am, I, I grew up in a home. My father was in the military for like 35, 36 years, command sergeant major. Then I married um, a soldier. He, he um, did 22 years in the military, TBI, PTSD. Um, oh, yeah. He has a Purple Heart Bronze Star. So dealing with, you know, the coming back stateside and all of that, you know, I mean, honestly, we went when he first got back, you know, he was just didn't want to be around people or you know, like whatever it is. And so part three, um, military <laughs> connections, you know, military oh, yeah. connections, spouses, not spouses, just everything. So part three, um, that's a part three show. Um, yeah, a lot so, of that. Yeah, because I forgot to say I'm from Fayetteville. So that's okay. where that came from. My father was military and, okay. you know, and I'm currently located in Charlotte, North Carolina as well. Okay, so that's where Charlotte. I'm at now. Mm -hmm. Okay, awesome. So you two, do y'all know each other? I don't know, oh. but we're going to know each other after yeah. this, right? Which y'all going to know each other now. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Right. And see. And so last but not least, Mr. Jimmy, come on and give us the part four show that we're going to do. <laughs> Introduce yourself. Uh, my name is Jimmy Henley. Um, I deal more or less on the administrative side. I have a mental health agency here in Fayetteville, Better Beginnings Healthcare Solutions. Um, we started... Uh, in 1999, when my father started the residential facilities and 
um, with intensive event home services, um, and we branched later in 2007 doing outpatient therapy along with medication management. Um, as you can see, this big music sign in the background, I'm also a musician as well. Um, so, um, you know, I don't know if my piano can be seen, but it's there. <laughs> but so I'm also a musician as well. Um, and so, yeah, that's my intro. <laughs> okay, so part four is things that you can do um, to release the stress with oh, mental yeah. health, playing, you know, music, playing, you know, sports, whatever it is, cooking, all that. Listen, we got some shows, okay? Right. So, so I'm definitely excited um, about this because I do want to do another show where I have women on as well. Um, I do want to, I want to do that where I have women on as well. And then I'm like, so many shows, this is like seven shows. So we have three shows here. Then I want to do one with women. Then I want to do one with men and women. So this is like five or six shows. So this is, um, this is just awesome. Um, so, um, I have been wanting to do this show, um, for some months now. Um, not that mental health is not prevalent amongst everyone, but from the things that were going on with, uh, with you know, the coronavirus and then the things that we've been seeing in the Black community amongst our men um, really hit a place because I have a, I have a Black husband um, and I, I have Black sons and I have, you know, people in my life that are male figures, a father that's Black, you know, and not just Black but also just males in general. Um, I said, you know, I really want to do a show because I mean, and y'all can, we're going to get into it and y'all can correct me with the statistics or whatever, but I really have, I feel like that a lot of times men, women will get help, but men won't get help as much as women because it's a stigma of, oh, you soft or you ain't hard enough or, you know, you can't cry or you can't whatever. And so, um, it triggered me, um, an uh, old teammate of mine um, that's a male, you know, was just talking about, you know, how, you know, he's been doing mental health, all these different things. And I was like, man, this is, it's prevalent, you know, and sometimes men don't seek help and it's okay to seek help. You're not a punk, <laughs> you know, you're not less of a man, you know, or whatever it is. And so it really hit my heart. Like, you know, I really want to do this, you know, amongst, you know, some men. And so I reached out, I've been wanting to do it for a while. So I was like, let me just put this out here. Um, and so thank you to all of you that agreed to do this show. We did have um, our brother, Mr. Eric Williams, he was going to be able to come on, but he has some different things he's doing with his family. So he wasn't able to join us, but I'm going to let him know he got to give me a part four of what one of our shows is going to be. <laughs> And so we're definitely going to get to meet Mr. Eric. Um, so I do want to go ahead and get started. Um, and I want each one of you, because I know that you all have valuable information to be able to share from so many different aspects, from being someone who provides the service and being someone, you know, who has a staffing agency, you know, that does that. So I want to go ahead and get started. And one of my first questions that I wanted to ask um, um, all of you to answer is, what does mental health mean to you? You know, because a lot of times you hear mental health, but what does that really mean to you? Does it mean, oh, mental health people, you know, because people, let's be honest, because we're going to talk real. We're going to talk true. Mental health people are like, oh, that person crazy. Or, oh, something wrong with them. But that's not what I think of when I think of mental health. When I think of mental health, I think of having a healthy mind, having a healthy state of being, being in a good place and it being healthy. Like you have healthy relationships, mm -hmm. you have a healthy diet, then your your mental state should be healthy too. So um, Damien, if you don't mind, go ahead, because um, you're right up there, I'm going to go around. If you don't mind, go ahead and start it. What does mental health mean to you? I, I definitely feel like uh, just to add on to what you were saying, just to piggyback off of that, it's a collection of, you know, your mental, your emotional, your social, your psychological well-being. Um, I look at it just as important as your physical health. Um, that, that's one of the reasons why I really got into this field is to, you know, reduce that stigma that's associated with mental health. And like you said, when we say mental health, you automatically assume crazy. I don't necessarily like to use that word, but that's the word that's utilized fairly often. Um, but being mentally healthy is one being being at peace 
uh, within yourself and being able to understand your emotions and being able to verbalize and express those emotions in the appropriate way. Um, so whether that's development of coping skills or just expression of your emotions through peers or family members or even you know your your own therapist being able to process those things you know appropriately because all of those things are connected i do see mental health as a connected piece to everything else and i like to work with the mind body and soul so if the mind is off it throws off everything else so that's mm -hmm. what mental health is to me is it's just a collaboration of all those all those facets being connected um together that's good um because my um, parallel fitness is what my, my business is parallel fitness, the champion's mindset. And so parallel fitness, um, if anybody is watching, if you go to my web, if you go to my website, it's mental, physical, and spiritual, because I believe that they all got to be, you, they got to be parallel. Like one can't be more than the other, you know, like they all got to be, all got to be fit parallel fitness you your mind got to be fit your body got to be fit and your spirit got to be fit um so definitely i agree with that um mr jimmy what does what does um, mental health mean to you um it means to me to be mentally healthy within myself to be able to um be able to be sociable to and be able to love the ones and care for the ones that's around me is when you don't identify that you had that, that importance of your mental health, sometimes your uh, deficiency or whatever, if I can use that word, is uh, it bleeds on others. And, and you know, so it means to me to be mentally healthy just so I can love and be able to social socialize with everybody, even in my workplace and, and that type. And also it can, your mental health, like you were saying earlier, if you're not mentally connected in the way you need, it can affect your physical. Like if, you know, anxiety issues can lean over to high blood pressure, all these things. So it definitely uh, is essential to have good mental health. So that's what it means yes. to me. That's important, the part that you said about, um, because it can definitely bleed over. So that is a very important part about, you know, what does mental health mean to you? Mental health, to, and what you're saying, it just makes so much sense. Mental health is, is about you and your mental state, but it also is about those that are around you too, is what mental health is. Um, Mr. Rain, what does mental health mean to you? Um, I actually like what you said. You said um, state of being. And mm -hmm. I think that really stands out because it is an overall state of being. You got to know everything about you and be self-aware, if you will, um, about your mm -hmm. you know, emotional, physical, and spiritual state, because all those things do tie into each other. So for me, mental health is about that kind of the total package, the formula, mm -hmm. if you will. Yeah. Um, and what I mean by that is like an, an example would be for somebody to act physically a lot of those things are affected by how you feel emotionally. Mm -hmm. um, and ultimately, it, it, it comes down to, you know, how you are overall, and that's going to be your spiritual. So you got somebody that may work out physically, but what happens whenever they're not there mentally, they're not motivated to work out. They're not right. motivated to do things. If you aren't there mentally because of things like relationships that they mentioned earlier, relationships, um, it might be something to do with financial uh, situations. It might have something to do with a pet, <laughs> with a loved one, whatever it may be. You got people that will be kind of blown away by something else that's happening in their life and their mental state's not there. So everything else is affected. And for those paying attention, you notice, just like you notice when somebody's been working out. They, right. they, you, you know, they're getting stronger physically. They might be losing weight. Mentally, whenever you see somebody that's happy all the time and, and you notice that they're not happy anymore, they're not doing the things that they normally do, they're not involved in the things that they're normally involved in, you got people that will talk to you daily and they're just not talking to you. And you're like, what's going on? What's wrong? And right. you really got to pay attention because if that formula isn't together, then you'll notice those effects. And right. it's just kind of knowing overall what that means. So like you said, state of being overall. Right. And, you know, from what you were saying, I just thought about something and I always say this, you know, when I talk about um, parallel fitness, mental, physical and spiritual and even when working out, I said, you know, 
if you see, and I'm just using this for, for, for an example, because women do it too, but I see it most often with men as far as it goes with working out. Most of the time, men like to work the upper body and they don't like to do a lot of legs. So sometimes you may see some men, not all men, but you may see some men that buff up top, but their legs are skinny. And you like, that's disproportional. That don't look right. And so I think about that when I think about us mentally, physically, and spiritually, you know, if the mental is off, then you big over here spiritually. Um, and that's not good, you know, and then if that's off, you you big yeah. over here physically, you know what I'm saying? You you looking good physically, but your insides are not good. Your, your spirit is not good. So that is so important. Um, and it just makes me think about because I also work in the school system with kids on a daily basis. And so I pay attention to them. I've, I've picked up on their mannerisms. I've picked up on their personality. And so um, sometimes I have conversations with the teachers because, you know, the the teacher will come to me because um, I'm a safe school coordinator. So a teacher will be like, oh, my God, Miss Davis, you need to get him because he was nasty and had an attitude with me today and blah, 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 blah. And I'm like, for real? OK. And so then when I go talk to that student and I look at them and I assess and discern, like, hold up, something's wrong today. Mm, yep. So I'm like, you know, so what, what's going on? Tell me what's going on. Man, I didn't come in with a good day I didn't whatever. And so then I know how to approach them. Then I oh, know yeah. how to talk to them. I know what mental state they're in. And I know whether I can joke with them or I know whether I can be the mama and be like, if you don't get your butt to class um, or whatever it is. And then sometimes I have to go back because teachers have hard days too. And I have to say, you know what? He was just having a hard day. It's not an excuse for him to be rude, but he got this going on at home. So what you said around us with our family members and who we're around is just watching people. So that's what mental health is as well. Um, so those are some amazing, amazing um, definitions of what mental health is. And I don't think that there's just one definition of what mental health is. There's so many different definitions. Um, mm -hmm. All of you gave amazing definitions. Um, so the next question that I wanna ask, because this is one of my, this is one of my favorite questions and because I really wanna know, um, and I mean, we see the statistics. Um, my question is, what are the stigmas about seeking pro professional help in general with men, African-Americans? You know, what are the statistics? Because we hear the stigmas. Oh, I'm not going to get no help because they because they people going to think I'm crazy or, oh, men ain't supposed to be soft or whatever. What are some of the stigmas that you guys hear you um you've been doing it for 15 years you've been doing how many years did you say you've been doing this rain um since 2006 so it's, it's 2006 been quite some time. right and then mr jimmy you've been in it for a long time with your daddy and all these different things so if you would start mr J uh, mr jimmy um tell me what are some of the stigmas that you hear um from men or just in general about seeking um professional help amongst men and then sometimes in african american men um, well, you, you kind of, y'all kind of touched up on it earlier. Um, the first thing they think is I, I'm, I'm not crazy. Um, and I don't need any help or as some, some go through self-denial saying they don't need any service and I'm good. And especially if they're in, let's just say, for instance, they're in a relationship and they're the female partner suggests that they get counseling. The first thing they say, we don't need no counseling. We good. We can <laughs> talk about it. We get all- I don't want nobody in my business. Yeah, mm -hmm. I, exactly. I don't want them in my business type of situation. So you get all the, they give a, a, a lot of excuses to say why they don't need counseling or you know any type of services. Wow. Yes. So, so many different signals. I don't need help. I don't want nobody in my business. People nosy, all that. Um, Mr. Rain, give me, um, what are some of the stigmas that you hear from people that come to see you or just in general that you've heard the stigmas, you know, that you've heard about men getting help in um, men in general and even in the African, African American community? You've actually mentioned some of them earlier. Um, I usually sum it up to strengths and weaknesses. And the reason I say that is because a man is, is supposed to be strong. The man is supposed to be, you know, the provider. The man is supposed to be able to take care of things. The man is not supposed to be, you know, open when it comes to problems like that because 
ultimately, like you said before, it is soft or some people even used to use homosexual terms when it came to that, you know, oh, you, you so-and-so. So it, it came to that, especially back in the day, like now things have changed a little bit, but back in the day, yeah, they, they say punk, you was a punk then. So, <laughs> so that was just a thing. And you have so much behind that. And as a result, people will avoid seeking mental health or behavioral health simply because they don't want that stigma behind what they got going on. And like you said, they don't want people in their business. Um, if it comes to any of their relationships, they don't want people to know. It's just, it's just this really soft subject. And the hard part about it is there's specific things um, which are very, very serious, if you will. Very serious things that will happen to guys. And, you know, we're talking about behavioral health as a whole, but there's specific things if it comes to like molestation or, you know, sometimes worse. Like it's a lot of those things is as a man, you don't tell anybody this stuff. Um, mm -hmm. As a man, you're supposed to be the one that can handle your issues. So it's considered weak to go see mental health. It's considered, you know, you're not, you're not a man if you go to see something like mental health. Um, same thing comes to counseling for like marriage and stuff like that. Same things. Those things are a big thing. If we're a couple, we're supposed to handle our problems together. So specifically black men do not want to go see couples counseling and, and have therapy and stuff like that. That's considered, you know, I can handle my problems. You know, I'm not weak, basically. So those are the type of things that, that'll happen stigmas right and so yeah. and here's the crazy thing one of the things that you said is people you know and i was even saying people would be like oh i don't want people in my business whatever but guess what um nobody has to know that you're going to get right <laughs> right it's confidential hipaa you know right. it's it's confidential so nobody has to know that you're going to get help so that again that's just an excuse you know that sometimes we use and we all have may have done it you know um it's just an excuse that sometimes is used because we just like, man, oh, I don't know, you know. So, um, Damien, what have you seen in your 15 years, the stigmas that you've heard about uh, Black men or just men getting help? Um, Y'all definitely raised a, a lot of uh, valid um, points and ideas that, that come across my, my desk fairly often. Um, but... For the most part, just the stigma, as Rain was saying, just from a, from a, I'll, I'll speak on all those, but definitely for the black man, it's you know culturally, one we're like you said we're we're taught to be strong, and I and in our mind, our perspective of being strong is being able to withstand without breaking down, which is mm. totally untrue. We all we all have that breaking point, um, so that stigma just growing up culturally and we can go all the way back to slavery to where we were taught in a sense to suppress our emotions we were not supposed to show our frustration towards our slave masters or our sadness when we were you know torn apart from each other all of those things and 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 as it progressively you know fast forward you know as a young child i don't know if the other two gentlemen on the panel experienced this but we were taught up in a sense that we're not supposed to express. The only things that were valid as far as emotions were happiness and anger. Those are the only two emotions that you can express. You can't express fear. You're not supposed to be afraid of anything but God, and you're not supposed to cry. You know, you're not supposed to cry. They'll tell you to man up really quick. I don't care if you have a broken leg or you <laughs> fell off your back and you scratched your knee. You're not supposed to cry at all. So what we're doing is that we're cutting off half of our basic emotions that we do have. So as we grow into adults, we're, we're still that half emotional being. Whereas a, a, a woman, on the other hand, has a full range of emotions. They're, you know, they're coddled, they're, you know, come here, give me a hug, all these things, they're able to cry, they're able to express their emotions. But a man on the on majority, of, I'm not gonna say all of them, but most men were taught not to express. So when you get in these relationships, and the, the significant other is saying, well, we don't talk. Like, tell me what you're feeling. We, we're like, well, we don't know. Like, I'm okay. I'm good. You know, because that's all we <laughs> truly know. And that's so good. We, have, we, we have to utilize these opportunities in relationships, for example, to be able to 
expand our range as far as our emotions. Sometimes that, that requires maybe going to therapy to understand those underlying emotions that, you know, that, that comes out. You know, we, we often mask it, whether that's through substance use, through any, some type of addiction, whether that's sex, mm -hmm. whether that's cars, whether that's whatever, to fulfill those emotional voids. So that that's one of those stigmas. Another stigma is faith. You know, growing up, you know, I grew up in a Pentecostal type of household. Go to the so, Lord. So it was more so, you know, <laughs> you don't talk about those issues. Take it to the Lord. He'll take care of it. But mm. if you're going to utilize that, you also utilize those verses in the Bible that said faith without works is dead. So if you're That's not right. doing actual work, you know, i.e. therapy or counseling or whatever the case may be, or some type of holistic practice, then you're not That's going to good. get anywhere with that. So just, just those particular historical standpoints from a, from a religious standpoint, from a cultural standpoint, all the way to where we were, at, you know, experiments we were experimenting on so we have this mistrust with the healthcare system that's primarily primarily caucasian you know so mm. they don't you know we don't feel like they understand our plight they don't understand us culturally they're not competent enough so if i feel like somebody doesn't know my plight why would i go to them and mm. so that that kind of raises a whole okay. other issue in regards to seeking treatment with someone that looks like you Right. right. And that's so like, oh, my God, you said y'all said a whole lot, because if you think about it, it's so true. The culture that we grow up in and that not just young men, but young men and women, the culture that you grow up in, um, even the culture of, um, you, you, I mean, I have friends and I have people that say, you know, my mama taught me, don't you be going out telling nobody your business. You know, so then they have trust issues that they can't trust people um, mm -hmm. because people are going to talk about their business or like you said, how the boys you grow up, uh, you you know, how a, a father or people may raise their kids and oh, you you know, you you don't need no help. I mean, because I have said that to my son before he I'm like, boy, man up, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you know, I'd be like, your, your leg hurt. You are right. Mm -hmm. You know. Um, then I'd be like, am I, you know, but the good thing, the one thing that I love about my husband is no matter how much, you know, he may get on them, you know, sports, my husband, and he, he hugs, he hugs our sons. And so that's one of the things too, culturally, a lot of times you don't get, um, you don't get a lot of sometimes, not all, you don't get a lot of men that hug their sons and that get, and that um, give love to their sons. So a man, man hugging, you know, that right there can also play play a role in it too in telling them I love you, you know, hugging them, you know, or whatever, you know, giving them adoration, you know, whatever it is. And so I think that that is amazing. These are definitely some stigmas. And like you said, the faith, you know, because my husband and I are pastors. And so, you know, we don't ever shy people away from praying for them, from talking to them. But I tell people, if you really need to go, if you feel like you need to get help, it's okay to get help. Yeah, it is, absolutely. you know, when my husband came back from Afghanistan, my husband and I got help, you know, with some of the military specialists because of the PTSD and just the things that he encountered. And so that that he would understand what I was going through as a spouse of someone who just got back. And so I would understand what he's going through as a soldier that's just getting back stateside because, mm -hmm. you know, and I'll share this um, and we share this sometimes is that. When he got back, it was just like, you know, if we would have an argument, it was just like, I'd be like, I ain't even said nothing. And so they had to get me to understand that just because he's doing it doesn't mean he's mad at me. And so what they told me and when they said it, he understood it and I understood it. So it opened up a whole new realm for our marriage. Like, wow, is that when if we were to get into a back and forth, you know, argument, for him, it's a defense because he feels like he's in theater. And in the military, in theater means that you on a mission and that you in theater and you about to get ready to go do whatever you about to do out there on the battlefield. So it made him feel like he was in theater, that excitement and that adrenaline. And so he feels like I'm the enemy, you know, and that's when they're first getting back. And I can understand that. And so she had to tell me, she was like, it's okay for you to retreat and just go away. And I was like, man, that makes so much sense because just think about all the things that they go through over there and that adrenaline gets going when you get into a back and forth and that adrenaline gets going. So um, we've, we've already shared so many great things. Um, um, my next question is, um, so before I get into the next question, 
do any of you know any like statistics um amongst you know males females caucasians african americans when it comes to mental health and how many get it who don't do i mean is any can you guys talk to that well no it's definitely one in four it used to be one in five uh but it's close to the one in four um african americans that well overall that experience you know some type of mental health disorder mm -hmm during their lifetime. Um, the percentage is even lower as far as those people that access treatment. African-Americans are, are on the lower end. We're at the bottom of the totem pole in regards to accessing mental health resources, whether that's therapy, you know, medications, whatever the case may be. Uh, we're usually the last on the totem pole to, to access that. Um, but we're also the highest um, in regards to our, our white counterparts, we're, we're more, uh, it's about 30% more to actually experience, you know, a mental health disorder or episode or, or you know, attempt suicide. If you can believe it, like we, we actually have a little bit more percentage wise um, in, in regards to those suicide ideations and actual attempts. Um, so it, it's it's one of those things that, that has progressively gotten better in a sense as far as the knowledge base and the awareness but also with that awareness it, it, com it comes up with the responsibility of accessing those resources so now that we do have this platform and you know mental health is kind of on the forefront you have celebrities back then athletes and all these different things um, that are actually promoting mental health from Charlemagne to Taraji P. Henson having foundations and all these things um, it, it, it allows us to almost normalize mental health. And what normalize it, it also brings, on the other hand, more people being more prevalent as far as being able to say, okay, well, I, I am suffering with depression or, anxi or anxiety and things like that, or bipolar or schizophrenia or something to that nature. So um, it, it's a good and a bad thing. It's good that we're talking about it, but we're, we're still the last people to actually seek treatment because of those stigmas that we talked about previously. Right. Right. Um, and as a result, go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah. No, 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 go, go. Oh, okay. As a result of what he was just saying, actually, that's where the uh, statistics can kind of be skewed because mm -hmm. there's so many more cases that there is an occurrence, but there's not necessarily a full report. They don't follow wow. through all the way mm -hmm. because you got so many people that will, you know, they'll be bothered by an issue. But like the stigmas we just said, um, mm -hmm. it kind of makes them back off or not say anything at all. So we don't report, we don't go in as much nearly as there are actually things that happen to people. Mm -hmm. um, we're the last ones to say anything. Um, unfortunately, even when it comes to a lot of young women that will go through different things, mm -hmm. just in behavioral health in general, like we're the least likely to actually report it and say something. So you don't find out either until way, way later in their life or because it'll come up like you just happen to be talking about marriage and stuff like that and it don't come out till the end that's that's some time that's going in but like it'll come out way later than where it could have been a little bit easier to be managed if you will wow. um, so exactly stuff right. like that happens a lot so the statistics are getting a lot better and they're mm -hmm. continuing to get better so that's a good thing a lot of people will kind of shut down on the idea of things like social media and just the media in general, but things are actually getting a lot more open as a result mm -hmm. too. You might see somebody that's got a, a comment and people start asking questions, what's going on with this comment? What you talking about, this ain't right, right. or something, mm -hmm. you know, and people will start speaking on it. So more and more, more and more people are coming forward with things now than it used to be. So as there's the negative and the positive and it's kind of like a weird kind of balance, but things are getting a lot better now as time right. moves on. Right. Um, I wanted to ask um, you, Mr. Henley, um, Mr. Jimmy, I wanted to ask, you've been doing this for some years, you know, along with your father and you you guys provide the healthcare services and stuff like that. Can you kind of speak to like, you know, generally the people that you see seek out the help, you know, do you see more African-Americans, more whites, more Asians, more Hispanic? What have you seen during that time, you know, as far as the stigmas and different things, but what have you seen most people that you get that, okay, I need help or, you know, or whatever? Um, I think one of the challenges within our community 
if I look at our target market within our agency, we we cater to more minorities, not saying that we don't see any other races, but that's what we cater to. But one of the challenges that I, I find in mental health, in this mental health business is that a lot of times when other resources are not in place for families and uh, for instance, if, you know, if, if one of my therapists is calling um, concerning an, uh, um, a, an appointment, or in scheduling an appointment, they may reschedule because uh, lights about to get cut off or mm -hmm. phone services are all. So it's one of the biggest challenges. And that's why I'm kind of glad they, they, you know, they're doing other things with peer support and everything else to kind of help with the actual uh, support uh, outside of what we do, because it's, it's very challenging in a minority uh, community to actually commit the services sometimes uh, to services for outpatient therapy. Uh, so we we try to, uh, like just recently, I mean, just today, one of my therapists, uh, she bought in a resource guide from concerning everything what's going on with, with the pandemic, um, which we're gonna get out to the families now so they'll know these are some other resources that may help you in this time. Uh, this is very challenging time, but you know, I can honestly say that we have had people reached out to the agency because of what's going on right now. People's anxieties are up, and so they are wanting services, but for, for the most part, the commitment come, becomes challenging sometimes, and I'm quite sure with the, the gentleman that's on here now, they can provide the services. They probably can testify this, to that sometimes as it's challenging where they have to reschedule uh, appointment, appointments because of those things. Right. So mm -hmm. um, when you said that, this question came to mind. So because that is so true, a lot of times in the minority community, you see that sometimes people can't get help just because of, you know, situations, either money, they ain't got insurance, um, like you said, no transportation, so many different things. So this is one, a question that I wanted to ask that just came to my mind. Since now we're in this pandemic and, you know, honestly, we can't go a lot of places sometimes and you're not doing a lot of in-person. You may do, be doing a lot of virtual or whatever. Have you guys seen an, seen an increase in um, seeing patients and that people, even minority, are now really seeking the help because they can do it virtually versus having to drive and ain't got transportation? Yeah, I mean, for me, I've definitely seen uh, a, 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 a huge increase in regards to us as Black Americans um, seeking treatment because this is, this is a, a global situation. This isn't something that's predicated on race per se or culture. Everybody is impacted. So the the level of anxiety and the depressive episodes and you know the the relational issues that you've been sweeping up under the rug for years and years you know come to the forefront you know if you've, you've been, been having you know, problems, yeah, if oh, you've yeah been, if you've been having yeah. marriage problems it, it's definitely gonna be highlighted now since you're at home you know 24 7. um so being able to address those things um in the comfort of your own home or you know virtually uh, I've, I've definitely seen that particular barrier because that has been a barrier as far as people getting back and forth, the financial issues, you know, just social economic status in general has always been a barrier and an obstacle for treatment. So if you don't got anything, everybody got a cell phone at That's this right. point, no matter where you are, you can go deep, deep in, in the hood. Everybody has a cell phone or Wi-Fi. You know, so so being that that that's available and it's really available for them, you know, that's actually um, reduced some of the obstacles and, and and so they've been, you know, the floodgates has kind of opened up in a sense for for me. That's just been my experience, but definitely. Wow, and I seen everybody else kind of shaking their head that yeah, this pretty much is kind of you know, um, with everything that's um going on. Um, so I also wanted to ask, um, my other question, um, so, and I think we've already kind of touched on this about what the benefits of a healthy mental lifestyle is, you know, we've talked about, um, 
you know, just, you know, the people that are around you, but can you just real quick, anybody or all of you, it doesn't matter. Just what do you think the benefits are of a healthy life, a healthy mental lifestyle? Um, you know, I can definitely say, you know, and I mean, I'm going to shoot this out here and I'm going to go on and say <laughs> this because I really believe that this is true. What I'm about to say. Okay. Okay. I believe that everybody has gone through some mental, some issues where their mental state has been off. I don't think nobody is exempt from that. Like as much as we try to deny it, as much as we, I mean, and just being honest, y'all probably have too, y'all, even though this is what y'all do, y'all probably have went through it. It may have been something in your childhood, marriages or relationships in college, whatever it is. But mm -hmm. I would just shoot this out here to say that I really believe that everybody in this whole world, this whole universe has battled in their mind or just is has been in a state maybe of depression or whatever it is and just like oh my god you know i mean me and my husband had you know we went through you know counseling when he first got back i mean i've even sought counseling myself for just different things that have maybe have went on in my life when i was a child or you know when i was in college or you know or whatever so i really be, am i am i off or is that a lie <laughs> No, at all. At all. <laughs> at all. I, I always say that um, everyone can benefit from therapy. Even okay. therapists need their own therapist. Mm -hmm. So it, it's nothing wrong to to speak with someone, to talk with someone, even if it's just for growth, for professional right. growth. That's the only constant that we have in life is change. So as we're changing and evolving, we got to get some type of understanding about what that looks like for us. So speaking another opinion or a different perspective doesn't make you crazy. It, it, right. it actually releases some of that so you can actually have a clear mind and you can actually find out what your, your purpose is, you know, in life. So that, that's definitely one of those benefits just to answer your question is to find out what your purpose is to improve your mood, you know, and relationships with other people. So, um, but that's just kind of segue into that, but yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah. One of those realities behind that is that counselors can experience through experience um, what we call burnout. Mm -hmm. So you get burnt out listening to everybody else's story. And the, and the fact is, you might have something similar going on in your life at a specific time mm -hmm. um, or have experienced something or let's be honest, you might have something that bothers you. Some people come to you with problems sometimes. You know, it ain't it ain't really what you want to hear sometimes. You like, man, and that they're, they're giving you information that affects you in a way, either because of an experience you had or just because of your your personal opinion on something. Mm. Like I've had counselors tell me about experiences with, you know, you might have somebody that is confessing to, to them that they did something bad. And I mean, you hear this story and, and in the, in your mind, this is this is affecting you. Mm -hmm. I've had counselors tell me that they had to give up a patient to another counselor because they were affected by something that, that you know, that was said or whatever the experience mm -hmm. may have been in their life. So, I mean, you go through burnout and you do have to talk to the other, you know, provider sometimes. You got to, you got to take care of you too. Yeah, <laughs> so I mean, I can That's a, a big thing. Wow, I can't, I can't, wow. That just, that just, okay. So, you know, I'm not a, um, I'm not a mental health therapist, you know, but I am a pastor. Y'all see my face? So I am a pastor. So, you know, <laughs> so, so I do know, and I'm, I love what I do. I love being there for people and talking to them. And so I can almost imagine, you know, you know, we have people that come to us and talk to us about different things, but I can almost imagine as mental health therapists or providers, the stories that you guys hear or the things that you guys, you know, go through. I mean, I mean, even from the thing of what if so, so if somebody, and this is just a question, and we're going to get to this next question I got, but if somebody comes to you and tells you, I killed somebody, are you, do you have, by law, do you have to give them up to the police or like? We, we have we have limits of confidentiality and the limits, um, depending on the state, but, but they're mostly universal. Um, if you're a threat to yourself or to mm -hmm. someone else. 
So, yeah. so if you if you did something in your past, that's your past. I can't really. I'm not a, you know, an attorney to prosecute you for that. I, I want to focus more so on how is that impacting you emotionally at right. this point, because that could be still, you know, something related to PTSD or depression or anxiety or paranoia right. or whatever the case may be. Mm -hmm. So, um, but there are limits to the confidentiality that, that we do have, but it's okay. only for, for, for the most part, you know, um, if you are a threat to yourself, or to someone else. If you tell me, hey, when I leave here, I'm about to go shoot up XYZ crib or I'm about to stab my wife because she got right. on my nerves, then, then yeah, I'm a mandated reporter. So I do report okay. those things. But previous things, it's like, you know, I, I can't really, I'm not the judge and the jury to decide right. what, okay. you know. Yeah, that that's kind of what I was wondering. Like, okay, so I can see that, you know, if I tell if I tell you, if I say, hey, Mr. Mac, Mr. Ryan, and Mr. Dane, when I get off this phone, I'm going to find that girl <laughs> and I'm going, you know, I can, so I can see that, you know. I, but that's you know, why you got to ask that. questions. That's, that's also why you got to ask questions because we have not only the limits, but you also have, you know, follow-up questions. So a part right. of the, I guess you can call it the, the technique or the procedure is obviously to recognize ideation versus intent. So right. you might have said something, that don't mean you're going to do something, but then you got to follow right. up and see what their intent is. So they might just right. say they're ready to kill so-and-so, but do you have a way of doing so? Like, what, right. what are you going to do? Mm -hmm. Like, they already got it down and they get they got they took notes on what they're gonna do. That's it, that's when it's the issue. They got they right. got the whole method, they got it planned. That's out. when, yeah, that that right there needs to be reported. But if they just right. talking about it, you can find a way to understand what's going on and see mm -hmm. what their intent is. Okay, yeah, okay. Um, so my next question is, um why is mental health important to you? And so I want to start with Mr. Jimmy. And the reason why I want to start with you, Mr. Jimmy, because this is a business that you have. You know, you don't necessarily give, you know, do that, but this is a business that you have. So I wanted to know why is mental health important to you? Why did, why did you decide to be in this business? Like, what was it for you? Well, truthfully, um, I'm like you, I'm, I'm in the church and, um, uh, born and raised in the church. Um, I, um, I know the gentlemen probably not where they are familiar with Fayetteville. I grew up off of Mercerson Road. So um, being in the church, um, I saw one world and then being in, when I got in my neighborhood, I saw another different world, mm -hmm. um, which was, and then I had to go to school. So it's like you had, you had different uh, things that that I've seen that I shouldn't have seen, but I did. Um, which uh, so a lot of this why I'm in this business because I realized that there are probably some children and kids that just like me that may have been in the church, but may have been exposed to certain things, whether it was peer pressure, molestation, whatever the case may be, and they may have experienced that, and you know. We used to, I came out, you know, say, you can't shout this out. You know, sometimes, you know, they want a praise break, but then after the praise break is done, you know, these issues are still prevalent. So, um, That's the exactly right. it is because I believe just like, you know, the Bible says confession is good for the soul. When I start releasing it to a, a, a professional or, or a, a good clinician, a good therapist, then I can understand some of the things that ha may have caused me to be the way I am. Um, we are all products of our little childhood. Whatever that childhood looks like, we are products of that. So I got in this business more or less, not saying we don't care to adults, but we see a whole lot of children. And the reason why is reason why, because I have a passion for children. And so when I got in, got older, I realized a whole lot of stuff about me from going to counseling that I didn't realize that I was holding within myself. There was times when I wouldn't even smile because I felt like smile, smiling was a form of weakness. Um, mm. So it was, you got to look hard and all this kind of stuff. And whereas like that whole thing was a whole protective mode because of my childhood where I felt like I had right. to be there. So, Mental health means to me and being in this business is because I know it really is essentially important to myself 
and to the community. Um, I feel like, you know, I try to talk to males, you know, just even pro bono for friendships to, you know, guys I may have done music with, to even encourage them to even go through counseling because you never know. It's like, it's, I can just say this, I can sum it up with this. Like I can look at myself now that I see myself in the zone, but right now, if I, if I, unless I'm in a mirror, I can never see this part, this head up. So nobody knows, I won't know what I look like unless I look in the mirror. Well, that's what counseling does. It allows you to see this part head up because you can't see this. Everybody else may see you suffering with how you move in and you think you're okay, but you can't see yourself. So counseling helps identify bad habits, all sorts of things that you didn't even realize that may have, like I keep saying that word bleed. I feel like a lot of us, if we actually go through counseling we'll start seeing where we was unhealthy in relationships, um, you know, when we was courting and how we hurt somebody else because of our own bad habits. So I'm in this because I believe that through this process of getting the right therapist and getting the right professional help, you can be, you can be in a good relationship. You can be in a solid relationship. You can be monogamous without, if you understand where all this came from. So my, my thing is, and that's just me telling my personal testimony, it's just certain things I couldn't understand about myself until I met, um, my, me and my wife we went counseling. We was going to counseling together. But then I, the more that the counseling started pulling things out, I realized, oh, I, I need to go individual. Uh, mm -hmm. Absolutely. And we, uh, can we set a little appointment? Because there's some other stuff I need to talk about. Right. Yeah, that was the best thing I could have possibly done. She said, "Okay, we're going. We'll get back to y'all. Let's do this separate." But mm -hmm. it's it's almost impossible to be in a healthy relationship when you are unhealthy. Exactly. Ooh, that's one of the good. reasons why mm -hmm. I'm pushing it for our men to get in it because you may have a desire to be in a healthy relationship, but we got to get healthy. That's good. We got to get. Oh, that's really good. You probably summed it up for all of us, but you know, that is really good. In order, to, you gotta, you have to get healthy. And it's so funny because the the second part of that question, you kind of already answered it. Um, because I have two more questions and I have to get y'all gotta answer these questions, and it's already 828. This has been so good. Um, so real quick, I want um you to, you know, just to tell me, you know, why why mental health is important to you, and you know. It could have been from a journey that you went through, but Damien and Rain, I just want y'all to share real quick why mental health is important to you because these other two questions I want to make sure that we get to for the viewers because I think it's going to help somebody. So go ahead, Mr. Damien, real quick. Uh, why is it important to me? I, I grew up in Orangeburg, South Carolina. If you're not familiar with that area, it's small town. You know, it's a school town. That's all we have Or you know, South Carolina State University. Shout out to the Bulldogs. My but but I grew up, you know, in the hood, and I've seen both sides. Like, and my man just said, I I, I kind of grew up in the church, but I also grew up on the block as well. So so understanding both both of those things and seeing being exposed to different things, whether that's positive or negative, and being able to make those choices. But not a lot of us are able to make those choices that I made to kind of get out of that particular situation, or we call it the trap. So. Once I got out of it and, and I wanted to understand on a deeper level the underlying issues, the underlying thoughts that led to a lot of the decisions that maybe my friends have made, family members have made, it, it allowed me to like dive into it, to become a therapist, to, to get to the root cause of a lot of those dysfunctional thoughts that we have. We all come from some level of dysfunction. So understanding that and understanding the distorted thoughts that we do have and being able to change those things and being able to eventually change our lives and our family's lives for generations. So that's why, you know, I got into mental health. I love it. I like it. Mr. Rain, real quick, um, uh, why is mental health important to you? Is it something you went through or is it just passion? What is it? Um, kind of a both. It's, I got a weird story. <laughs> But obviously military background. My father's in the military, so let's just say I've been somewhere everywhere. Mm -hmm. And as a result, I've experienced different cultures. I've been to different places. I've been around so many different types of scenarios when it came to people and their families, um, just exposed to a lot of things. And I've always been the type of person to question why. 
why do why are things certain ways with certain people so i got addicted to looking into what behaviors meant like why does this person mm. act like like this why do you know why is his personality like this versus why my personality is like this i was That's one good. of the one of the fortunate few that had the same mom and dad like same household i i had mm-hmm. that a lot of my friends i grew up didn't have that it was either they had a different you know they had a step parent or they just didn't have a one parent in the house at all so or they came up with their grandparents it's all kind of different things that got me into wondering why people were the way they were um and yeah. as i aged i started getting more and more into it so i did study that in school obviously in the military that's when i joined the military I end up working in behavioral health as well. I've always just been curious, but I've always believed in people. Um, and what I mean by that is, I know you're like this because of this. As a result, like I've had so many types of different friends and I can get along with some of everybody. I'm country, so it is what it is. I'm gonna put that out there. <laughs> but I can do in interaction with people what a lot of people can't do because I know how to understand certain things based on experiences I've had. I can work with right. different cultures. I can work with people. A lot of my friends had self-esteem issues. Um, they had disabilities. You'd be surprised by going through life and just generally being communicative with somebody, like mm-hmm. what that means for them. And that's just kind of the world. It, it became my world. So I just loved helping people and being the one that puts a smile on their face. And seeing that made that something that I've always wanted to be a part of. Wow, that's awesome. That's what, yeah, that's kind of where behavioral health became, like I said, Mm -hmm. my world. (laughs) And then you study it and you get addicted to it. You get addicted to behaviors. And and then something that you said, you know, because the military, you know, will take you different places. And like, you know, for me, when I, my dad was in the military, I didn't have to travel or go anywhere like he we didn't have to move you know then my husband and I once I met my husband he only had like a year or two left in the military and then he was out but through my travels with running track and field professionally I've traveled all over the world and so I have encountered different cultures different people different attitudes different just dealing with people and so sometimes like and you know sometimes like I even watch myself you know even people with disabilities you know I've dealt with and so sometimes I find myself and I'm like, how, you know, and then, you know, some people are kind of scared to deal with people with disabilities, you know, they kind of be like, mm-hmm. you know, and then I'll find myself just like having a conversation or getting along and I'm like, I have never went to school for this in my life. <laughs> but just, I think because, you know, I've traveled the world and I've experienced so many different things, I just end up somehow adapting and being able to just kind of like, you know, talk to them. So I think that it does have a lot to do with, you know, the things that you have experienced. Like you guys are talking about your childhood, you know, the things that you've seen in church, you know, the things that, you know, that Damien said, like he was, you know, on the block being in church, you know, and then you in the military and dealing with so many different people. Um, that's good of why mental health is important to us. Um, so I have to get these two questions. Um, and I think these kind of go hand in hand. And so you guys can answer these one by one, hand in hand. One of the questions is, what are the indications that one may need to seek professional help? Um, and then the other one is, you know, kind of, I'll leave that for the end. You guys can sum it up. But what are some of the indications that you guys can think of that someone needs to seek professional help? I can definitely say probably substance abuse could possibly be one. Um, substance abuse, um, sexual abuse, meaning like, you know, you, 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 substance abuse you you lean after you know whether it's drugs or alcohol or something sex you might have a sex addiction or you know or just what are some of the things that you feel like are indications that someone may need to seek professional help or some type of help i could start um one of the common ones that we we kind of looked at especially when it came to military experiences um was little interest or pleasure doing the things that you normally do. So when you got somebody, and I kind of mentioned a little bit earlier, you got somebody that's just not doing the things that they normally do. Um, you kind of look into why, once again, I was addicted to why. So I always look into the why, I try to understand things. And that's one of those things that stand out 
when you got somebody that does something, like I said, it could be daily or it could just be commonly, you know that whenever they have little interest in doing the things that they normally do, something's going on. Um, and the reason that they need to seek help with that is because there's something underlying there, if you will. So like that, that was a big one that stood out. Um, and just real quick, another one that kind of goes along with it. When you see people that are just, or hear people talk about things when it comes to their well-being, like they don't care about their health. You don't, they don't care about some of the, you know, things going on in their life. Like, well, you know, that's not a problem. And you like, um, that, that kind of is a problem. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so you just, sometimes you gotta, you know, you just gotta give them that little bit. Like you might want to go ahead and seek help whenever they're, whenever there's major things that can affect them in a right. major way, especially whenever it, it comes to their well-being. So like, that's when it gets into that ideation part, when you start thinking about, you know, what people say or what they do. And it, it's kind of get on that fine line when it comes to suicidal ideation or, you know, thoughts of hurting themselves or like he said before, hurting others. Like you, you can tell whenever somebody needs to seek help in that way. Mm. I don't want to take all of them, so I'll let them. <laughs> I, 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 and, I, and I won't be, I guess, maybe as more more pervasive because those are, are definite, you know, symptoms and maybe behaviors as an outcome of those thoughts and emotions that someone may have. But when you have small things just like um, lack of sleep, you know, yeah. you're not sleeping at all, insomnia, or you may be sleeping a lot if you're sleeping all the time. Um, that that may push it, push the envelope towards more sort of depression and things like that. Um, if you're eating all the time or you're not eating at all, so so, so those two extremes are, are also tell signs of something is going on. Um, irritability. We often look at people as depressed. Uh, depression. And we 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 look at it as this person sitting in the corner you know, in a ball, crying their eyes out. In actuality, sometimes it just, they may lash out more. They may be more irritable, more easily agitated or easily triggered um, by, by small things. Th those are actual signs of depression or even anxiety. Because people with anxiety or PTSD, they're hypervigilant. They, be, they may become more aggressive in a sense. They may speak verbally more aggressive or become physically aggressive. And just a, a, a persistent change in mood you, you never know what you're going to get with the person from day to day. One day they're up, one day they're down, you know, and it's kind of like this all the time. So the, the influx of a mood or deflation in that mood can also raise some eyebrows. Um, if you're mm -hmm. easily distracted, unable to, you know, remain focused for an extended period of time. Of course, mm -hmm. we all have short attention spans, mm -hmm. but when it's more pervasive than, than not, when you're often forgetful of things or, you know, you start having these night terrors all the time. Things like that, just small things that we that we normally look past or we was like, oh, I, I never get any sleep. But if you're not getting right. any sleep, that means that your mind is constantly moving constantly. all the time. So right. why is that? Back back to what Rain was saying, that, that right. why? Why is that happening? So it doesn't have to be a psychotic episode, you know, to, <laughs> to, some, to, to that right. extreme. Uh, for you to seek treatment. It could be just something as simple as, hey, I'm not sleeping. You know, right. instead of going to get you some some NyQuil out of the cover, it may be something that's a little bit more deeper that, that mm -hmm. you're processing through and that you may need some answers for. So sometimes that's, that's right. what therapy is for as well. And, and then you see that sometimes people use those things like if they're not sleeping or they're, you know, or mm -hmm. they, they become codependent yeah. on certain things. You know, um, and so those can be signs too. Um, I wanted to ask you, Mr. Jimmy, along the same lines, you know, of things that you see because you did say that you work a lot with children. Can you say something to with you know even more with children? What are some of the things, some of the signs that you may have seen um, that with children possibly? Um, just monitoring their um, behavior. You know, um, you know, a lot of times, you know. It's on the educational side because I work in the school system as well. A lot of times the educational side, they don't know sometimes the behavior don't have anything to do with deliberately having a behavior, you know. And so sometimes we um, kind of miss, you know, misinterpret that within the classroom. But it's just monitoring and like you did when you, you opened up the show, 
and he was talking about the students in the classroom, uh, you know, I know, you know, I did, we had a summer behavior summer camp and one of the things that we noticed that one of the girls that was, every time it was time for her to read, she would um, kind of show a behavior. So when we actually put her by herself, she actually read fine, but guess what it was? It was anxiety issues where mm -hmm. the, she just had an episode and reading in front of people. So, you know, just monitoring and, you know, asking questions, you know, to make sure that what you interpret is right before you assume their behavior problem. That's right. That's good. That's good. This has been so amazing. It's been so eye opening. Um, I love this because this is real dialogue, you know, um, things to look for. Um, and it's, and I was, you know, I'm just like, oh my gosh, I could go on and on and on. And I'm thinking everybody that's on this watching people are enjoying this. Um, but before we leave, um, I want each one of you to answer this question and I want each one of you to do this because I believe everything that we've talked about tonight has been amazing. I mean, we've talked about different perspectives. We talked about so many different things. I mean, you got the military, sports, church. I mean, this has been phenomenal. Um, and like I said, you know, just with the things that were, that are going on with the, um, with COVID-19, the pandemic, um, and especially the things that have been going on amongst our black men in the community. I mean, can you imagine, you know, the things that have gone on when George Floyd passed and just now, you know, even when the thing happened in Georgia where the where the guy got shot execution style, my sons would go outside and jog around the neighborhood. I wouldn't let them go, you know, and just so many different things, what that can do, you know, when this happened, um, we sat, especially my 10 year old, um, he was 10 at the time, our son, and I we sat him down and we talked about, you know, the George Floyd thing. And my son began to cry at 10, you know, and I, and I, and I did the scenario with him and I just said, you know, how would you feel if, you know, what would, and I put him as him being the aggressor. I said, if you were the aggressor with one of your friends that was white and you put your, and you put your knee on his neck until he couldn't breathe, what do you think would happen? He was like, I would get in trouble. I was like, you know, how would you feel? He was like, I'd feel bad, you know? And so we explained to him and he cried like, you know, and so emotionally, you know, this has been very good, you know, to talk about it amongst, you know, about males and black males, you know, because I feel like I don't know, what are the statistics, the statistics between um, um, racial, you know, the racial divide in mid, um, black, white, Asian, you, like you said, we at the bottom, you know, we don't usually like to go get help and things like that. But one of the last things that I want each one of you to hit on before we leave, and we'll start with you, Mr. Henley, is what advice would you give men or black men or just anybody and not just men? maybe even women, because we got women watching this show. What advice would you give someone who's contemplating seeking help? What advice would you give them? They're thinking about it and they've been on the fence. They really don't know. What advice would you give a man, a woman, a boy, a girl about seeking some help? Um, I would, what I would do is, you know, tell anybody that's, you know, seeking help is, you know, you, you have your options out there to actually find a good, solid provider. And you, with clients' rights, there's no question that you can't ask. Um, and make sure that, you know, you ask questions to make sure whoever the clinician is that you are willing to see that they specialize in whatever that is. Because um, that's, you know, some people, some, some clinicians have they you know, their specialty. Right. Um, so I would suggest, you know, asking, asking, getting help, calling agencies just to find someone that they are comfortable with. That's right. um, and, you know, and just ask questions and what you don't know, you know, don't assume just asking nothing's the clinician is not going to not answer your question. So if right. you want help, just ask questions and find out what the options out there for you. Right. And before the other two answered, that is so true um, because I've looked, you know, I, I I like researching and, you know, different stuff. And so I've even seen, you know, and that is just kind of, you know, also a good tip and, you know, 
is when you're looking to seek help, don't just say, okay, I'm just going to pick this person. No, actually seek and see because there are certain people who don't deal with certain things. Some people don't deal with substance abuse. Some people don't deal with PTSD. Some people don't deal with sexual abuse. Some, you know, there are people deal with different things and then seeing who's a good fit for you because I could call and ask Mr. Rain to, to, you know, to counsel me or to be my therapist. But if I don't get a good connection with him, then maybe I need to call Damien or maybe I need to call Mr. Mac. You understand what I'm saying? So that is definitely good. Making sure that you seek out, um, send email, you know, see the vibe that you get from that person, see the, the energy, see the connection that you get with that person on, you know, is this going to be the good fit for me? Um, Mr. Rain, what would be um, some advice that you would give somebody who's contemplating seeking help? Uh, I'm a, a very, very strong believer in being your best you. And I'm the type of person, me being open, very honest, I, I don't like limits. Mm -hmm. So what I would tell somebody is, you know, you got people out there that want to be the best athlete. They give their, their all to be the best athlete. You got people that that are out there to be the best speaker, the, you know, the best writer, whatever it may be. They, they push their all into being the best at what they do. But I can tell you right now that you limit yourself by not recognizing that you can't be your best you until you handle everything that's going on in your life. That's right. So do you really, you know, you ask the question, like, do you really want to be limited like that? You don't know how, how far you can go until you take care of you and to release that limit may, may show to you, may reveal to you the person that you actually are supposed to be. Mm. Um, and then I'm old school. So <laughs> I like the list. That's the other thing. I, I give them homework. I, I write down the list and the list is this. So what things are bothering you? What things are affecting your day to day right now? And write those things down. And then write down the things that are going to, you know, affect you by going to seek help. Like what's going to be the bad? What's the good and the bad? Everybody know the list. What's the good and the bad? What What's going to benefit you by going to seek help? And what's going to, you know, bring you down by going to seek help? Mm -hmm. And if it outweighs the bad, then you probably need to go seek help. Right. That's just me being old school. But, you know, that's something that really you know, somebody can do practically right. and recognize that they might need to go ahead and do something. That's so it's good. more encouraging than mm -hmm. anything else. Because sometimes good. you just got to hear it from somebody else. Mm -hmm. Right, mm -hmm. you do. Mm. Uh, um, Mr. Dave, um, some advice that you would give somebody that's contemplating um, seeking help? Yeah. Um... First, if you're contemplating it, that means that you need to go. All That's right. good. I, I tell people that all the time. Like, if, if you're contemplating whether, whether or not you should go or not, that go. means you need to go. Um, mm -hmm. Secondly, um, you, if you get an annual checkup on your physical, why not get an annual checkup on your mental? You, oh, yeah. you, you don't know what you don't know because we're stuck in these patterns. So your pattern of behavior is just something that you're used to doing. You don't know that it's dysfunctional until somebody else recognizes the dysfunction and tells you that it's dysfunctional. So you don't know what you don't know. And sometimes just getting that different perspective from an unbiased and non-judgmental person will, will do world of amounts of good for you. So there, there's no negative in seeking help. That's right. It's only it's only adding value to what you already have. Even if you're not struggling with something, you know, sometimes just being able to get some things get off some your things chest off. And, and being able to express that without any negative feedback coming your way or mm -hmm. destroying relationships or whatever the case may be. Sometimes you just need that. So mm -hmm. just from a mental health standpoint, if you go get your checkups and you're physically healthy, you know, focus on your mental health as well. So get that check up, you know, find your therapist, like you said, that you vibe with, because not every therapist is built the same. Every, That's right. Everybody is different. You know, I'm a little bit, as you guys can see, I'm like all tatted up and I'm kind of like one of those boys from around the way. I, I got my education, all that kind of stuff, but I, I'm able to connect with people in that way because they see me as a 
normal person. I'm not this, you know, Mr. Rogers type cat, you know, and, I, and I'm able to speak the lingo and all those things. So I'm able to connect with them on that particular That's level. So find, a, so find a therapist that you connect with on that level right. and develop that relationship or that rapport with them to get the most out of, you know, what you need. That's really good. That is really that is really, really good. And just thinking about everything that you guys have said is so true. Um, one of the things that I always think about um, is, you know, you if you, like you said, if you contemplating, go get you, you, you need it, you know, and just being open and understanding that you got to be truthful. You aren't going to, it's not going to change if you're going to lie, if you ain't going to be tell the truth, you know, you have to tell the truth and you have to get that help. Um, this has been phenomenal. You guys have given so much wisdom. You guys have really put it out there. You've been open. You've been honest. Um, you've come from so many different perspectives, so many different angles, and it's just been amazing. And so I'm just thankful to you guys taking this time on a Thursday night when you could have been doing, well, basketball ain't on or nothing like that, or football, so. Yeah, is playing right now. Oh, they are? Ooh, my bad. It's all right. <laughs> um, but uh, um, I really, really, really appreciate this. This has been phenomenal. I'm going to have to do this again. Um, this has been awesome because, you know, I think people don't talk enough about mental health. You know, people don't talk, and especially, especially, I'm sorry, in the black community, we just don't. Um, we don't talk about it enough, and then amongst our men, it's not talked about enough. So I really appreciate you guys being vulnerable as well and open, um, and sharing, you know, the experiences that you guys have been through, um, what you've seen, what you've dealt with, um, and so honestly, I hope whoever is watching this, everybody that's watching this, if you go back on Facebook and watch it, if you go back on YouTube and watch it, I hope that you find something in here that helps you, because this has been phenomenal. It has helped all of us. I really hope this has um, spoken to somebody in a deep, dark place that has been contemplating going and get help, and that from this, you realize you can get help. I've I've had help before, okay? I'm a pastor. I was an athlete. I'm a mom. I'm a wife. I've had help before. I've, I've sought out help. It's okay. These, these professionals here have said, we all need help. They probably got help before too, and they need someone. Even if you feel like, oh, I don't want to go to, and like somebody said, I think it was Damien, and I think all of you said, sometimes just going and talking to anybody, you know, you might call your best friend and say, I just need to talk. I just need to talk this out. It's good to clear mentally, to clear the clutter out, to get it out. Mm -hmm. I tell people all the time, sometimes before you go to bed, write stuff out so that your brain ain't on 20 when you go to sleep, you know? So um, thank you so much, Damien. Thank you, Mr. Um, Rain, Mr. Um, Jimmy. Thank you guys so much for this conversation. Um, some people are saying amazing. They said this was a super conversation. This was awesome, helpful, and needed. So we have reached some people. You guys have reached some people on tonight. Um, um, encourage people to come back and watch this. I'm going to share the YouTube link with you guys. You are more than welcome to have people come back and watch. And we're going to have to do another one um, because there's so many different aspects of mental health that need to be talked about. Um, men, men, children, sports, military, church, there's so much that needs to be talked about. And so I'm so thankful to you guys spending this Thursday, this Thursday night with me for an hour and a half almost. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, but the conversation was great. Um, and so for everybody that's watching, um, we were talking about mental health. Wasn't this mental health month? Awareness, was it? It was mental health awareness week. A couple weeks ago. It was earlier. Yeah. But yeah, it might be a month. Might as well. Yeah. It was, yeah. Yeah, it was earlier. It was earlier. Yeah. But um, so thank you guys again. Um, everybody that was watching, this was Candid Conversations with Coach D. Listen, mental, physical, and spiritual. Okay, you have to have it all together. Um, and just like I say every time before I leave out, um, it's been amazing. And remember, mental, physical, and spiritual, it's not just a workout, but it is your life. This is your life, y'all. It's not just about working out. It's your life, your whole life. So thank you, everybody, for watching Candid Conversations with Coach D. Until next time, I love y'all.